and let me share my screen so that I can start my presentation. Okay, so uh, let's start with this today's presentation is um, on the uh, remote sensing platforms and I would specifically focus on airborne remote sensing system for the polar applications or specifically developed for Svalbard research. And I, as I uh, as mentioned by Liz, I work for SIOS and SIOS is also a northernmost Copernicus relay on the planet where the, under which we also provide information about the Copernicus satellites and uh, information available for uh, Svalbard region. So uh, since this is remote sensing talk, uh, let's start with the ground-based remote sensing. If this is the picture and how, how things are uh, changing faster uh, in polar region. So this is the picture from yesterday while I was walking to my office and I sit in Longa Pian, uh, you can see on the map and at the exact location of my office is just showed by the arrow where it's next to the cantina. And this is the picture I captured yesterday and this is today. So you can see that uh, how significantly things can change in polar regions. It's, uh, so, uh, and this is, this is one thing why we need sensors and why need, uh, we need more information about the polar regions. So with this uh, picture, starting with the ground best remote sensing, I would focus on today's talk. What I would speak on is first I would introduce about the SIOS, what SIOS is, and then I would focus on the remote sensing activities of SIOS uh, when, while introducing what are what is the new remote sensing platform we have launched in the last two years. So uh, starting with the first thing is the SIOS and the SIOS data management system. Why uh, to start with this is uh, why Arctic or why Svalbard is as it's uh, very prominent to know that uh, the, the first news in 1922, where when the American Council at Bergen reported that the Arctic is warming and it is felt by sea, hunt, sea hunters, explorers, and fishermen. That's the first record of the warming. And we, we have the, with the different sensors, we have the data set showing that Arctic is no more to, uh, warming twice, but it's already three times the amount of compared to the rest of the globe. And in even in Arctic perspective, Svalbard warming is high. And you might know about the last year's news in June 2020. We broke the 40 years of record of uh, temperature by setting the record of 21.7 degree temperatures. And so uh, this is why uh, we have the observing system in uh, Svalbard uh, because of this uh, uh, warming and the uh, pressing questions about the Svalbard. So uh, SIOS is the Norwegian initiated international collaboration to create the observing system and which is focused on the open, free and harmonized data. And we have regional interest in uh, Norwegian archipelago of Svalbard and associated waters. And we focus on the earth system science questions. And <clears throat> our vision is to, lead, to be the leading comprehensive long-term observing system in the Arctic to serve the earth system science and society. And our mission is to develop efficient uh, observing system, share technology, experience, and data, close knowledge gaps, and decrease environmental footprint of the science. As I mentioned that it's a collaboration of the institutions. Uh, we have uh, 26 institutions from nine countries, and you can see these uh, logos of these institutions and the countries which are involved in this observing system. So basically, the, uh, the, the observing system is the high Arctic system. And more, this is, as I mentioned, it is more because of the most uh, severe temperatures increase in the Arctic. In the Norwegian high Arctic, the archipelago of Svalbard uh, already has a substantial research infrastructure. The New Olsen Research Station, the Longyearbyen, Hornsund, and Barentsburg, extensive institute, institutionalized uh, international cooperation for more than 15 years between institutions from about 20 countries with coordinating committees like New Olsen Science Manager Committee in ISMAC, uh, Longer PN Science Education Forum, Svalbard Science Forum. So in addition to that, we have high data transfer capacity between Svalbard and the Norwegian mainland and in the future between Longer PN and New Olsen. So Svalbard has the infrastructure to study both upper and lower atmospheric layers 
unique potential for use of satellite data, high overpass rate, uh, in, uh, specifically on site data collection and also the calibration and validation. And uh, we have harbor facility for research vessels in several locations, and that proves that we have a high quality research infrastructure to do science in Arctic. So, SIOS uh, works uh, towards what, as you can see in the picture, we have the dotted infrastructure, ground based research infrastructures on the Svalbard and the satellite based or the remote sensing based uh, observations. And the uh, SIOS works towards integration of this new and existing infrastructure and data. And it's a, it's a network of systematic observation to have the better temporal and spatial coverage of key observational data. And uh, of course, it's, uh, it, it is for the reliable access for the long-term monitoring data in Svalbard. And basically, in, in a broader sense, I can say that it's uh, for improving research conditions for the scientists working in the system science. So with this uh, basic introduction to SIOS, I would introduce how SIOS works or the, how observing systems uh, data management works. It's a SIOS data management system called SDMS. So we have the, the data centers from the institutional data centers and they have their own procedures. And the, each data center for institutional data center has its own set of data management facilities for ingestion of new data and, and associated metadata and then maintenance of the data sets, including metadata and for the data curation. The SIOS don't change it, uh, but bridge these uh, data sets from the data centers and the integration through dedicated working groups in SIOS. So the approaches uh, we follow is that the SIOS uh, SDMS is built to be data set oriented. This means that the data sets and the descriptions of the data sets are critical for efficient system. The open data space approach means that we don't have strict boundaries on what is considered as a data set as their, their form can vary between disciplines. The net centric means that they don't, we don't have one central storage, but network of connected data centers that are providing data that work well together. And, the, and as you can say that the interdisciplinarity comes into the picture already uh, with this approach. So here you can see that uh, the different institutional data centers and their uh, sharing of the data through SIOS KC. And uh, even we have uh, uh, data centers from uh, outside SIOS member institutions. So SIOS is focusing on the first system science in order to support this effort and data, data and products describing the relevant process are required. And this can be result from the long-term monitoring efforts or ad hoc efforts uh, focusing on process studies by different institutional. But establishing a virtual data center that's offered the unified access to the relevant data is the task in SIOS KC or the knowledge center where we unify this, all these data centers to the data SDMS. And here you can see there we have the portals from the uh, uh, SIOS member partner repositories and even also non-affiliated sources. And uh, so the SDMS harvests the data from the member repositories as well as from the non-affiliated repositories. And the non-affiliated ones are some that have data that is relevant for us. And for example, that contain measurement data uh, from Svalbard and surrounding areas, but not part of the SIOS. And this data is all then made available through SIOS data portal. And these, this information about the data sets are harvested on a daily basis. This uh, information is wiped once a month. And this is done to ensure that uh, if there are updates in metadata and or data sets that information, we don't have pointing or stale or dead data sets or something like that. So with this uh, SDMS, how the data, we handle the data. Uh, now we have all the data, but we, we also define SIOS core data. So what is SIOS core data is that the SIOS core data have been defined to optimize the resources contributed by the SIOS research community. The core observational program of SIOS should provide the research community with systematic long-term observations, yet flexible enough to integrate uh, upcoming new methods and research questions. So uh, there are three uh, criteria for uh, defining this uh, SIOS core data is scientific requirement, uh, members commitment, and the data availability. So we have the scientific science optimization advisory group with the task force that defines uh, the process of defining the core data. And the, the criteria are based on standard of scientific excellence in the earth system science in SIOS framework and the SIOS data policy. And for now, we have al almost have the 51 variables classified as the SIOS core data that uh, we have defined this as atmosphere, cryosphere, terrestrial, and ocean. 
uh, but I won't go into the details of this because this is not the focus area of the today's talk. So to today's, uh, if you are more interested in SARS core data, you can go through the website of the SARS and see that uh, what kind of core data we have defined by now. So uh, this is just the basic information about the SIOS and the, how we handle the data, how, what kind of data is defined as the SIOS core data. But with this, I would start now exactly the today's topic is remote sensing activities of SIOS. <clears throat> and starting with the why remote sensing is in polar regions. And this is a classical cartoon. I downloaded from the internet. And here you can see that the field campaigns of the whole polar regions are very difficult, if not impractical. And the earth observation and remote sensing provides a cost-effective means to acquire synoptic coverage of the polar regions from the space. And one example is that this is this is Haik uh, Kili uh, and the director of SIOS, who is uh, digging the snow pit in the Antarctica uh, in the left side. And why do we need innovation or the remote sensing is that we don't need these uh, pits to be uh, to appear on the cold Antarctica or old uh, Arctic. And why? So to get this such kind of measurements, this is just an example why we need the innovation or the remote sensing observations. So to reduce the environmental footprint on the uh, of the science. Uh, and remote sensing, it, it, I talked about the remote sensing in polar region, but why remote sensing in Svalbard and Arctic? Uh, it's, uh, well, I would just focus on that. So you can see that sometimes remote sensing is the only way to achieve some information in Svalbard. And for instance, uh, as, you, as you see that uh, because of pandemic, most of the scientists couldn't reach Svalbard in last year and very reduced number of field activities happened in this year. So uh, there are in, in Arctic lack of adequate ground infrastructure and the lack of adequate communication systems in Arctic. Also the remote sensing uh, is environmental friendly as I uh, demonstrated in the last slide. But the, to note that in why Svalbard is that Svalbard has among, uh, among the, in whole Arctic has among the best available infrastructure and that makes the calibration and validation of remote sensing data uh, attractive. <clears throat> so the remote sensing can be many things uh, like satellites, uh, like sentinels or rockets, uh, sounding rockets and balloons and radars. Uh, also unmanned aircrafts and drones or locally guided drones or uh, fixed measurements. <coughs> Sorry. So in SIOS perspective, is uh, SIOS is an infrastructure endeavor, but the infrastructure must be closely connected to the clear scientific case. Uh, ideally, the science case should come before the infrastructure, but the sometimes new technology keep capabilities not initially envisaged scientifically. And that's why the remote sensing infrastructure is just necessary tool for providing data to most of the scientific cases. And sometimes it's the so remote sensing is an additional or supplementary tool to the other observational tools. So uh, in SIOS, we have the SIOS remote sensing service that I lead and our remote sensing service functions as a single point of contact for satellite information for Svalbard and gives assistance for access to remote sensing data. It also informs about the potential of satellite data and how to use that, uh, like training courses. And we aim to be a forum that brings together product users and the providers in order to improve the usability of the satellite data or the remote sensing data in collaboration. So uh, integration, uh, integration in science perspective is a buzzword. It uh, covers broad field of science. Uh, and is, is, it is also based on the integration of different scientific fields or spheres in Svalbard perspective. The integration applies to all of the infrastructure and the remote sensing capabilities covers most of the in situ measurements and has thus the broadest integration capability. Uh, for instance, we have a lot of uh, satellite data in the Svalbard and a lot of uh, in situ observations in, uh, collected by the ground measurements. And the integration also implies to the capability of making data available. And the SIOS website is increasing with the av availability of all the data and the remote sensing data have come the furthest with the close coupling to the Norwegian ground segment satellite data.no and other open data sites. And integration and the cal value here, you can see in the picture about the chlorophyll uh, in the conspiot and these ground measurements, which are taught, which are shown in, as dots. And 
Uh, this is this is something what I can say that Solvat has the best infrastructure for high Arctic sites, as I mentioned, and this is ideal for satellite carbon. And new instruments or the satellite instrument must take this into account that this is uh, important uh, for their calibration and validation. But also, uh, SIOS works towards why, how SIOS does that, because the satellite owners need the best calibre to create the best measurements to justify the large investments. And the SIOS works towards planning and collaboration and integration by facilitating the dialogue between the satellite owners or space agencies and the field scientists who are con collecting the data in the field. So this is in general uh, uh, introduction to the uh, SIOS remote sensing uh, services. But now I would focus uh, very, I'm coming to the, the today's topic. Uh, what is the new remote sensing platform in, at Svalbard? So uh, here is the uh, new SIOS and North. The North is the Norwegian Research Institute, which is a part of SIOS uh, consortium. And this is the Norway's first research aircraft with the first passenger aircraft with the high resolution remote sensing capabilities. And why this is, uh, this is such a good idea or what are the arguments for a pod project uh, putting the sensors into the aircraft, passenger aircraft. So satellite optical instruments uh, require cloudless days and is a challenge on Svalbard during the summer, even in summer months, because you get uh, much of cloud cover. Even you can see that on the, uh, on the uh, Sentinel coverage or the Svalbard, you, you might find many of the images cloud uh, with the clouds. Uh, but, but with this platform, we can fly under the clouds and with the excellent conditions, especially uh, for low sun conditions or when there, there are clouds, it is poss still possible. Second is that the platform is already in Solbert and can collect data when the conditions are right. And we have fixed flight lines uh, between Longyearbyen and New Olesen and Longyearbyen and Station Noor in Greenland and also Longyearbyen and Svea. Uh, and also we have high spatial and temporal resolution can be achieved. For instance, uh, we, can, we can achieve 25 trips across the Fram spec per year. And that, that's why it's a cost-effective tool for dedicated remote sensing missions, and it can be used for collecting research data combined with normal flights, uh, normal passenger flights to New Olesen or even in Svea or in the station north for the logistics purpose. And uh, in addition, it can help heal the gap in emergency preparation preparedness system for the high north. So the what, what is this payload is about is uh, uh, longer be an LVR, uh, longer be an LN uh, loop transport uh, payload integration is that uh, the important uh, information here is that uh, what are the design requirements for that no capacity reduction with the regard to the passenger and cargo because this is this is the chief uh, operation uh, application for this uh, uh, aircraft uh, to deliver the passengers and the cargo in different sites in and so on but and uh, prepare for the semi-automatic operations of the pod or the sensors inside the uh, inside the aircraft and may be flexible to for being monitored by the pilots. And uh, we, are, we also thought about the sliding door for dropping the buoys uh, to in the ocean or the other equipments or measuring sensors through door. So this is this is uh, some uh, quite um, this is a diagram for only for the technologist or the engineers. Or how right here you can see that they, we have sensors here and the phase one camera PNR and the uh, IMU uh, unit and the other sensors and they are, they are connected with the uh, with the system itself uh, within the aircraft and IX controller is the brain of this all these uh, sensors together. So what are what are the current payload into this uh, aircraft or the sensor? Is the first is important is hyperspectral imagery uh, is uh, in visible near infrared uh, spectrum, and it is made by Norwegian Electrooptics, and it is is useful for detection of the and classification of objects, for example, vegetation, oil on water or algae, and uh, it has the resolution up to uh, 3.26 nanometer spectral resolution, and we we get uh, many bands around 160 uh, more than 160 bands for this uh, uh, for using this hyperspectral imagery. But in addition to that, we also have the medium format camera for 
generating the high resolution orthorectal orthorectification of the photographs and to generate the 3D models of the terrain. And that, that is called phase one camera. Then we have broadband radios to retrieve data from buoys uh, to, uh, and uh, realize the data sharing or the coordination. And uh, even we have PIS for information for uh, better real time coverage around the small part. And we have GNSS for the accurate and direct georeferencing of images. And if you are wondering how much uh, is the capacity of this capability of group transfer down here, is that around 2,400 kilometer round trip range, yeah, as, as shown from the long uh, it's as drawn as a circle. And that has uh, the range for the round trip. Uh, for, for instance, it's approximately 20 flights per year to station node from long Abian. Station node is in Greenland. And, and we have weekly flights to New Allison and Svia from Long End. And that's the, the, this plane is higher for charter uh, for uh, measurements or the uh, dedicated missions. So what are the opportunities for this, uh, for Arctic science? So here you can see the Arctic mammals or detection of this, uh, uh, this Arctic mammals or counting or localization, size estimation. That is that's, that's something uh, we can think about, but also, uh, we have the research applications like CS properties and dynamics, vegetation mapping, or Arctic biomass ecosystems, population mapping, even in glaciology, for instance, uh, generating the digital elevation models using the phase one camera. And we have mass, uh, it has, it can, this data can be used for the changing the chair, uh, studying the dynamics and the mass balance of the glaciers. And also snow cover or albedo or ocean color, for instance, chlorophyll and primary production or organ blooms, something like that. So these are, these are something, uh, some, some of the applications of the hyperspectral sensor and the phase one on the aircraft. So coming to the, uh, how do we plan the missions are, uh, it's, it's important that we, we need the resolution requirements to determine the flight uh, altitude. And that's why we need, uh, uh, more information when we ask for the uh, ask for usage of this uh, uh, this aircraft, we need more information on the what kind of uh, images the scientists they are looking for, and the, we also define determine the overlap and side lap as you can see that from the camera, and that uh, that also depends on the requirements. And uh, basically, this overlaps uh, define the altitude uh, uh, overlap and the higher and the height determine the distance between each image. And also, uh, the flight lines are calculated by software uh, in field software in the NORS, and that also calculates the flight lines and the uh, other parameters for the camera. But uh, we, the, we all we actually uh, define this uh, all missions into the three risk levels depending on uh, the distance from the uh, distance from the long European. For, for instance, we can operate about within 250 nautical miles of long European and you also without any extraordinary measures. But uh, th this, this mission should be, uh, should have the prior permission from the governor of Svalbard based on the risk uh, uh, levels. And, and the most important is that uh, for applying for ground resolution is usage is, uh, usage and the ground resolution is uh, important parameter. So how, uh, how do we conduct this uh, operation is that uh, it is a semi-automatic uh, uh, operation. Uh, we plan, uh, for instance, uh, pilot's responsibility is to planning with regard to the next flight lines and programming with the uh, fiber management systems integrated in GIS. And this we generally use for, uh, for the start of the payload before takeoff or, uh, but after the generator starts and then the status control of the payload via iPad and the name of the next flight line and the waypoints, uh, the same as in GIS, which is provided to the pilot. That is the responsibility of the pilot. Then we have ground crew that connects the ground power and the payload computers on, uh, computers on, and then dump the data into uh, to the ground computer uh, via Ethernet cable after the missions. And the NORS uh, is a member institution who takes care of the software maintenance and the processing and validation of the G uh, validation of the data and also geocoding. And then we share in SIOS, we share the data through SIOS um, on metadata through NLive, uh, which is the uh, which is the uh, live system on the NORS or the NORS website. 
So uh, it's it's also has the automatic uh, recordings um, for for instance software detects when the aircraft is lined up on an active flight line. Here you can see the 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 red line is the corridor where we capture the data. But we need uh, additional blue line to just take a turn away, uh, take a turn from the waypoint, and uh, and that's that's calculated uh, man manually or the uh before we were planning the mission based on the what area we are focusing on and uh we we also don't capture the data out of the uh, when, when we are just using the aircraft for getting a turns through the waypoints and this is why uh, this operation is semi-automatic and there are some improvements uh, uh going on the assignment of uh, assignment of the scheduling software like auto generation of pipelines and this is now done manually and even using QGIS or mission planner and also startup and checkup shutdown or uh, automatic instrumentation control systems like camera control or something this is also uh semi-automatic at the moment and uh, finally the data sharing and storage system uh, currently we the processing consists of several steps using multiple different software packages uh, that when we get the data out of the aircraft uh, and then it has many uh, processes and some are some software are proprietary and that's why that and this this uh, involves much of uh, time when we get the data and uh, making it available for scientists and uh, also the computers because it's a terabytes of uh, data we collect from the um, hyperspectral data we collect from the aircraft and it takes uh, uh, a lot of space to transfer this data uh, from the aircraft to the computers and uh, that's why the, it, we, we are still working on the improvements of this making it more automatic so uh, given the, the background of this uh, we, we first tested this system in 20, 2019 uh, in September, in the month of September, we received around 50 requests on the aircraft, and these are the locations of the request. But we uh, we could just cover a few of the areas such as Kongsvegen or Kora Islands and Advandalen and the part of uh, Longyearbyen. This, is, for instance, this is the image of uh, um, Advandalen on the on the bottom, and this is the hyperspectral data. And you can see that typical flight lines uh, generated through the areas submitted by the researchers are looks like this and. Uh, we don't capture the whole the data, whole data, but we capture only the uh, specific areas from these lines. And as I mentioned here, you can see about the uh, uh, you can see that uh, even uh, even with the aircraft, we had uh, bad weather days for three three days, and it's it was difficult to fly. Uh, this is this is just a, a example of uh, how what are the results for these uh, missions. So uh, this is a mosaic and the elevation model uh, generated by uh, for using the fixed 4 d software. And then uh, we have the ground control points and the accuracy you can see about around two to uh, seven centimeter for X, Y, and Z location. So uh, this is quite an excellent accuracy for the, uh, the Dornier mission in the New Orleans. Uh, but still it, it also depends on the terrain because the universal area is quite flat and if you capture the data sets in different terrain conditions it might vary and that's why this is still under uh, process so uh, uh, we will learn some lessons from this test campaigns in september 2019 so, so for instance many requests were partly overlapping or close so uh we we now what we do is when we receive such kind of request to capture the data we we possible combine multiple uh, requests into single flight lines and then we try to make it more uh, 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 affordable for uh, pilots and even cost related to this uh, flying and uh, as i mentioned that uh, generating flight lines and importing them into the to pilot is manual and it's uh, it might have a risk of entering wrong coordinates and that's why this is also something where we can uh, improve on and the data processing is not streamlined yet and but we are focusing on this uh, process now and uh, with these two years of experience we should be there uh, in a place where we can provide the data earliest after the uh, capturing of the data sets in the care top. Uh, another example I mentioned that uh, uh, supplementary information why how what kind of data we can collect from uh, this donor is also uh, collecting the data from buoys and uh, this is this is one example uh, when we captured when we had two flights uh, 15th January in 2020 
uh, but that was failed because the radio or the buoy never responded. But uh, on the 19th February, we uh, tried another one uh, uh, and we collected around 4 GB of data from buoys using the radio in the uh, uh, in the audience. So this is this is supplementary uh, sensor which can be used uh, for collecting the data when it is not possible for, to travel uh, by ship or if it is not connected with the satellites. So future plans is that radar on board Donier, we are planning, but this is not, uh, this is not the, uh, done yet. And this is mainly because the Norway is a SAR country or even in Svalbard, we have uh, dark periods um, in, uh, in the winters. And that's why the SAR comes into the picture. And it also has the relevance of the cloud cover. But this, is, this was, uh, this is uh, proposed by NORS, but it's not implemented yet. And this is uh, something, um, something in the future plan of NORS. And I think we will hear more about this in coming year. So okay, this, is, this is something uh, I uh, covered only about the platform, but some of you might not know about the hyperspectral imaging. So I just added a few slides, what hyperspectral imaging is. Uh, I would go faster because I have less time to remain now. So uh, the hyperspectral sensor, it uh, captures the data in different substances, uh, in different uh, wavelengths, and it is a, it's a data cube. For instance, uh, the quick example is that here in this picture, you can see that uh, uh, there is one uh, artificial plant and there is a Lego missing person in this uh, picture. But how can we, we cannot identify this with these uh, eyes because we have limited capacity with the eyes. And uh, for example, the spectral properties of cameras has three different modes is monochromatic or the multispectral or hyperspectral. In the hyperspectral, you see the image in 10 or hundreds of narrow spectral bands. And uh, the hyperspectral imaging, captures the data in the data cubes or the data. And here you can see the changes in the colors of the, uh, this picture in different uh, wavelengths like 473 nanometer or 547. So it's not a good idea to, since human, I can only see three bands at a time. So band selection and different band selection using this hyperspectral imagery is important. Uh, so here you can see that even changing the bands, you cannot easily identify which is which part is artificial. But if you click on some of the changing uh, the bands and playing with the bands, you can easily identify with the different bands, uh, easily identify which is the artificial plant with based on the spectral signature. And also you can find out the anomaly and the spectral signature as the uh, missing Lego man as the white picture uh, on this uh, on the left. So this image processing is uh, in an indispensable part of the hyperspectral sensor system. Here we have the camera processing and the presentation. And uh, it is also, uh, it's, it's not simply cannot, uh, computers cannot simply visualize the uh, hyperspectral data. Uh, we have to make the, uh, use the different band combinations and see the data or process the data. And there are many advantages and disadvantages of uh, this heavy data set systems. But I won't go into detail. So this, this is just an introduction to those uh, who do not know much about the hyperspectral sensors. So after that, I would go quickly go through the, in last few, few minutes, I would go through the SIOS airborne campaigns. Uh, so using this aircraft and the hyperspectral sensors, we, we had the missions. Uh, the, so SIOS supports these scientific projects using hyperspectral data and aerial imagery, uh, using both using the aircraft and the drones. And this, this idea was developed in last year when most of the scientists couldn't travel to uh, Svalbard. And there was a uh, threat to have the missing data sets into, uh, into long-term time series data sets. Uh, and this is why we supported, uh, we invested around 2 million kroners to support scientific projects from science member institutions. And uh, as I mentioned already that we provided these two cameras which are on board, uh, 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 on board Dornier, uh, for example, uh, that captures the two images per second and around 10 centimeter ground resolution for around 800 meter swath from the thousand meter of altitude. And also hyperspectral sensor that uh, captures images on 30 centimeter from a thousand meter altitude. And we, we provided this opportunity and you can see uh, in campaign 2020 in the last year and uh, campus 2021, which was just uh, uh, concluded in, uh, in the month of August uh, on the first week of September. 
and we supported around 10 projects and 25 flight, uh, flight hours were spent. And even here in 21, we spent around 20, uh, 11 projects. And to just to enlist uh, some of the projects, you can get more information about these projects on the SARS website. But to just to let you know that we had a variety of projects for, for instance, glaciologists or uh, our terrestrial ecologists and terrestrial vegetation scientists and even bird researchers. They, uh, they, they got the images which will be helpful for their, their research. And even 21, we just concluded this, uh, uh, this campaign. And again, we have a variety of projects uh, starting from the icebergs and counting reindeer and also uh, evolution of the sorted periglacial circles and also uh, learning the mapping the surface properties of the, uh, the glacier. So uh, we have a variety of the projects uh, supported in the last two years. And with this, uh, I would quickly go through the uh, some of the applications of this, uh, uh, which are which are just preliminary results out of this uh, uh, yeah, uh, campaigns. So first is the uh, identification of the crevasses. This is very important in Svalbard when you conduct the field survey. And here you can see in the left side, uh, you, you see uh, the image from the Dornier and the uh, to, on the satellite, how uh, efficiently we can see the crevasses using the Dornier images. And that is quite important uh, when you carry out the field work using the snow scooters. And here, another example of the same that you can see that more examples, how much detail on aerial photograph can provide in comparison to the satellite data. So uh, not only this, but uh, interesting, these are the reindeers seen from the aerial pictures. And that's that's quite uh, significant because uh, the reindeer counting in Svalbard is still a manually laborious job to uh, do that every year. And uh, with the new technology, we with this like drawn in images or the drones uh, that can be uh, cal um, that can be measured uh, remotely and with efficiently with the covering large areas so this is one example and of uh, how scientific case for uh, terrestrial biologists and not only this we we also train the next generation of scientists to process this data and we recently uh, concluded the science hyperspectral remote sensing uh, training course and we there were around 40 uh, 35 participants selected out of 80 uh, applications and they also worked on the mini projects and some of the mini projects are uh, uh, are presented recently and I can give some examples uh, for instance uh, in der derivation of the uh, relative chlorophyll concentration using the donor data uh, but this is this is just a preliminary uh, analysis and uh, it is not validated with the ground data so it it just happened it, it just happened in the last two weeks and uh, we, we, we are uh, thinking to uh, get get it uh, get this uh, these efforts together to make a final report of this uh, all these efforts together and finally this is this is the uh, special issue we we host on the remote sensing journal where we support such uh, uh, application from the donor data or the hyperspectral data sets and we we are pla we are planning to continue until 31st of december and if you are interested to uh, have uh, if you have a case study of using the hyperspectral data in small part, you are more than welcome to contact any of the editors. So with this, uh, I would, I'm on time, I guess. Thank you for listening. And if there is question, uh, I'm happy to take some questions. And my email, I, I'm not sure it's not visible, but it's, it's there on a slide, but it's not visible. I, if, you, if you need my email ID, I can put it on the chat box to get in touch. So thank you very much for listening again and uh, questions. Well, thank you, Shrida. That was a fantastically thorough overview of everything that SIOS does in a very short amount of time. So, uh, so really appreciate that. You'll need to lie down after this. Um, so we have, uh, we have uh, questions. Um, I've got a few from the panel and uh, there's one in the chat box. So uh, Songbo Shi, um, Asks, could the remote sensing identify potential dust source regions and actual dust events? And uh, second part of that question, when you mentioned surface properties of glaciers, do you mean albedo or do you mean something else? So two questions from Zongboshi. Oh, you're on mute right now. 
Okay, sorry. Uh, so dust storms, I think it is possible to identify the dust storms, but I have never uh, read thoroughly about this kind of papers. But I remember during my doctoral research, somebody have worked on these dust storms and using the satellite data. But uh, I'm not in the position to, uh, to confirmly say that, okay, it is possible, but uh, I need to read a lot on that. So, but they, uh, somehow I remember that I have, I have seen such, uh, such kind of papers. Uh, uh, about the second, uh, the the property surface property of glaciers is is not the albedo, but the surface uh, features uh, about the uh, the crevasses, like as as I mentioned, or the glacier surfaces, like melting snow and the different types of snow faces. Uh, but but also the albedo is one of the properties. But this 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 was not the focus of this project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of very interesting work going on on, uh, on glacier albedo around the uh, around the world, and I'm sure there's uh, there's some of that going on in Svalbard. I know there's some uh, some interesting uh, algae work happening up there, and in yeah. fact, we have some growing in our lab. Um, so, um, some some questions from from uh, a few members of the panel. Um, what we're we're curious about is how you manage to integrate all those different kinds of data sources. When you're working with the the data from the aircraft, you have very tight control over the data chain from collection right through to to uh, how people can uh, can use it. How do you deal with different data sources that are collected by different people? Um, how do you ensure that it's uh, that it works in in your system? And also, how do you ensure that um, it adheres to fair protocols? Yeah, so this is a good question. I think the, uh, you know, for instance, airborne data sets, we have the streamlined processes. Uh, as I mentioned in my talk that these processes are not developed yet. Uh, so what we are doing is developing the protocols for how to make this uh, data available, because this is the first time we captured so much of data, like terabyte of uh, hyperspectral data. And we are also uh, thinking the ways to find the solutions, how to make it available and uh, how to follow the metadata standards, international standards. And this process is still going on. So I cannot answer it fully, but this, this is undergoing task. And I think in next one year, you will get more information about this. Uh, when the data is uh, available. But yes, we have the SIOS data management system working group. We have uh, experts from different member institutions and they define how to do this thing. But uh, I'm, I'm not a part of the STMS, but uh, we have the uh, scientific integration and data officer in SIOS who takes care of these things. Right, so at the moment it's, it's a kind of uh, committee-led effort. Do you think there's any opportunity to automate that? Yes, this, this is this is a dream. I think uh, automatic. Uh, even we, we are thinking, in, uh, since this process is semi-automatic at the moment, and we are thinking, not because uh, at the moment one one research scientist or engineer uh, who ha from NOS has to travel to Longyearbyen and get the data and then uh, process this and then transfer to computers, process it and then make it available. So this. This has many semi-automatic uh, uh, interventions from humans. So, it's uh, the the ideal situation is that we we dream to be there that we we don't have to travel any engineer, just a hyperspectral sensor on the aircraft, and you just need to provide the area where you need the uh, images, and that should do automatically and transfer the data automatically to the system and process it to get the final product. So that's the that's the aim. But the, this is, I think, this would take a lot of time uh, because there are many constraints, uh, technological constraints. And the size of data, as we can see, that one terabyte data in one hour of uh, acquiring acquisition of the data sets and aircraft, it's, that's too much of data. So uh, we will be there, but uh, we don't know when. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's just a matter of time. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge, especially working with lots of different kinds of data. Um, are, there, um, are there any kind of things coming down the pipes in the future that you think will really enhance your science? So, for example, you were talking about uh, testing of 7G around uh, New Orleans and, and in, uh, in Longyearbyen. Um, do you think there are any future technological opportunities that will really enhance your capabilities? Uh, yes, I think the, the, the sensors are developing faster, and I think uh, in, in every spheres, like in, in buoys, in the ocean uh, gliders, and even 
uh, terrestrial sensors uh, with the hyperspectral sensor we tested, I think that would the hyperspectral sensor would make the Svalbard one of the richest uh, region where we have the richest uh, hyperspectral data. So uh, that that would change a lot uh, in future because with so much of data, the challenge is to get the products done out of this. What information we uh, we can retrieve from this? So uh, the new things coming up is to not only the new sensors, but the new methods to derive this information uh, and quickly. So, uh, and I think the pandemic taught us that uh, there are smarter ways to do field work here uh, in Svalbard. Even you are, uh, when you are not able to travel to Svalbard, you you think that how to, how smartly I can do, and I don't have to travel much in Svalbard in, even after the pandemic. So the the changing situations also it's a motivation for many scientists to derive such kind of things. Yeah, but uh, uh, indeed the the coming coming sensors not only sensor but innovation in the uh, in the research it's it's a key for this and that's why the SIOS has uh, recently opened the new goal of innovation award and that first award will be given. Uh, will be awarded in Svalbard Science Conference in Oslo in, on 3rd of November. So if so, any of you are joining that, you will know that uh, we work on innovation and we support the innovation in Svalbard. Excellent. I look forward to uh, hearing from the uh, from the winners of that inaugural award. Maybe uh, maybe they can do a webinar for us next year. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, a, a final question. Um, as, as a polar scientist, I know that the biggest logistical problem that we have in doing polar science is weather. Is there anything else that you particularly have to deal with when managing your data collection and your um, your data validation? Yes, uh, weather is the big challenge and clouds uh, that, that's included into the cloud weather itself, but these are the biggest challenge at least from the uh, remote uh, airborne or the satellite remote sensing perspective, that's the biggest challenge. Uh, but also some of the challenges is that uh, the satellite sensors are not exclusively developed for polar science. They are developed for the other applications. So we don't have, uh, we, we have very few sensors, for instance, ISAT uh, by NASA. It's, it's for the studies and changes in the ice sheets, but not uh, many sensors are developed for exclusively for the polar science. And that's, that's where the gap is. And I believe that uh, getting to getting these priorities from the polar science to the space agencies and uh, will will improve this picture to get dedicated sensors for this region and that's the that's the problem i feel uh, apart from the uh, weather conditions yeah that's a very good point um but you know, I, I sat and, and prior sat as well. We've got improved coverage at the polls. People are are realizing that we uh, we do need the data there. And and yeah, I think I think programs like yours um, can only help governments realize what's what's possible if you have a lot of data um, to enable science. <laughs>